Okay, well, as I said, welcome and good afternoon. Uh, this is the penultimate um, lecture in the series, the Historic Towns Trust Spring Lecture Series uh, in association with the Borders and Borderlands Research Network at the University of Bristol. Very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Keith Lilly, and I'm the chair of the Historic Towns Trust. Um, and uh, this afternoon, we're going to be hearing quite a lot about uh, this particular new publication of the Historic Towns Trust. Um, we have two key individuals involved with this particular project, uh, Helen Fulton and Giles Darks, speaking to us this afternoon. Um, the lecture is being recorded, um, so it will be viewable in due course uh, at your leisure. Um, I want to say just a few words, really, if I may, first of all, uh, about Helen and Giles. Um, and to say something also about the housekeeping matters. Um, so first of all, um, let me introduce Helen Fulton, who is Professor of Medieval Literature at the University of Bristol. Um, she works mainly on medieval Welsh and English literatures uh, from the point of view of urban space and cultural identities, especially around the March of Wales. She is the co-editor of the Cambridge History of Welsh literature published in 2019. And very importantly here in relation to this new publication, she's also a trustee of the Historic Towns Trust. And in fact, Helen has been instrumental, I would say, in leading and steering uh, the Bristol 1480 Historic Towns Trust map project uh, that brings us here uh, together today. But this is a joint lecture, as you've gathered from the program. So as our um, other speaker, our second speaker in this joint session is Giles Darks. And Giles is a professional cartographer um, specializing in thematic mapping, formerly a senior lecturer in cartography at Oxford Brookes University. He is a co-author of the book Cartography, an introduction uh, published uh, as a second edition in 2017 by the British Cartographic Society. Since 2009, Giles has been working very closely with the Historic Towns Trust as our cartographic editor, very important person, creating, designing and publishing our maps and atlases, including the four most recent volumes of the British Historic Towns Atlas, and of course, uh, important in the production of this, the Bristol 1480 map. Um, so thank you to, to, um, to Giles and to Helen for uh, contributing to the lecture program and also a special thank you to Helen for um, coordinating for us the spring lecture series for the Historic Towns Trust uh, with the Borders and Borderlands Research Network. Uh, the title of the talk this afternoon is called Making Bristol Medieval. We're going to take some questions at the end. Please use the chat function and I'll be keeping an eye on those uh, and we'll have a discussion at the end of the talk. Um, and also a little bit of housekeeping. Do please, if you wouldn't mind, just to mute. Uh, if everybody wouldn't mind muting, please. And also turning off uh, cameras. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so please, um, Helen, I think, is going to speak first. And then we're going to hand over to Giles, uh, making Bristol medieval. Thank you very much indeed, Keith, for that kind introduction. Thank you. And welcome to everybody. I can see from my screen that we now have 81 participants. So it's very nice to know that you're all out there somewhere in the ether. So as Keith was saying, the main aim of tonight's lecture is to introduce you to our new map of Bristol, which was published by the Historic Towns Trust in December 2020, just as the second lockdown was beginning. So we had no real opportunity to tell people about the map or take it around the local bookshops in Bristol, though despite everything, the map is selling very well. It's available online through your favorite online bookshop and it's now available in real bookshops as well. The production of the map was very much a team effort as um, Keith has indicated. Uh, the, the sort of... Um, Project leadership was done by myself and also with input from Professor Peter Fleming from the University of the West of England, um, a real expert on medieval Bristol history. And we were greatly assisted by a very keen group of local historians who between them have an encyclopedic knowledge of the city of Bristol. 
and the design of the map was by Giles Starks and he's with us this evening to tell you about his part in making the map. But first of all, I'd like to explain how we went about producing the map and why we chose to make it a map of the medieval city of Bristol. The map was funded partly by the University of Bristol as part of a larger research project which I'm leading called Making Bristol Medieval. And the long term objective of this project is to change the perception of visitors to Bristol and perhaps the perception of some of its residents as well about the nature of Bristol as a historic city. Currently, Bristol is perceived primarily as an 18th or 19th century urban location. This is the period of its shipping and trading heyday as a great port. And this image of Bristol is supported by much of its surviving streetscape. There are still many fine 18th and 19th century buildings in the streets of Bristol today. So many of the city buildings date from that period. There are artworks in the City Museum and Art Gallery which depict industrial Bristol and tourist attractions such as the SS Great Britain promote the role of the city in the great age of commercial shipping. This focus on Bristol as a commercial and industrial port city, almost wholly occupied with transatlantic trade, obscures the older history of the city as one of the most important urban developments of medieval Britain. So the aim of my project is to reposition Bristol as a medieval city bordering with Wales and to bring to light its architectural, topographical and documentary legacies in ways which will, I hope, spark the imaginations of local residents as well as visitors to the city. So our map of medieval Bristol is intended to encourage people to seek out the traces of medieval topography and architecture which are still visible in the modern city. What I'd like to do now is sketch in some of the background to the early settlement of Bristol and its medieval glory days as one of the most dynamic cities in medieval Britain. The first urban settlement was in the 10th century in Anglo-Saxon England and the little town was known as Bridgestow, the place by the bridge. The site of the settlement was deliberately chosen for its strategic significance at the point on the River Avon where a bridge could safely be built. The town was built on a peninsula of land jutting out into the River Froon and the River Avon, making it very easy to defend. So Bristol was very much a border town, starting with its earliest settlement on the borders of the late Saxon kingdoms of Wessex and Mercia. As you can see from this map, Wessex in the south, Mercia in the, on the borders of Wales, and Bristol um, around about here, right on the border. So it's been a border town from its very earliest days. Its location on the land route from London to the west, as well as its sea seafaring links to Wales, Ireland and Europe, guaranteed its strategic importance to the English crown. By the mid 11th century, Bristol had a mint, indicating that it was a place of some consequence and it was engaged in regular trade with Wales and Ireland. After the Norman conquest of 1066, the Normans used Bristol as a strategic headquarters for the spread of their settlements into South and East Wales. The Normans, of course, were great castle builders as part of their colonizing strategy. They colonized areas through building towns, castles and churches. And they built a castle in Bristol as early as about 1088, blocking the landward approach um, and surrounding the castle by the rivers. So it was a, probably around this time that the first town walls were built as well around the castle. So this is a, um, a piece from the map showing the area of Bristol Castle with the Avon River to the south, so towards the bottom of the screen, and the Froom in the top right of the screen. The strategic significance of Bristol for medieval kings was very evident during the civil war between the heirs of Henry I, his nephew Stephen and his daughter Matilda. Stephen took the throne on the death of Henry in 1135, but in 1139 Matilda, who was by then married to Geoffrey, the Count of Anjou in France, 
sailed across to England to claim the throne as the rightful heir. And this threw the whole country into a civil war known as the anarchy. Stephen managed to hang on to the throne, but in 1149, a new enemy appeared, namely Henry, the eldest son of Matilda and Geoffrey. When Stephen died in 1154, Henry took the throne as Henry II, bringing with him large swathes of France, including Normandy, Gascony and Anjou. During the period of the anarchy, Bristol, like most of the southwest of England, came down on the side of Matilda and her son Henry, and thus were at odds with King Stephen. We have a lovely description of Bristol as it would have looked in 1138, when the Lord of the city, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, prepared for a siege against the king's forces. Robert was an illegitimate son of Henry I and thus the half brother of Matilda, which explains his loyalty to Matilda and her attempts to gain the throne. He accompanied Matilda to England in 1139 and led troops on her behalf in Normandy. And he also used his castle at Bristol as a central point for English rebels against Stephen. At one point, Matilda took refuge with Robert in Bristol, in the castle, one of the safest places in the country, and she later sent her nine-year-old son Henry to Bristol in 1143 to be educated there because it was so secure. And after Robert's death, Bristol continued to be guarded by his son, William, Earl of Gloucester. During the reign of Stephen, an anonymous chronicler wrote a Latin account of this civil war known as Gesta Stephani Regis Anglorum, the deeds of Stephen, King of the English. The chronicle begins with a generally favorable account of Stephen's reign up until 1148, and then continues in support of Henry Plantagenet, now described as the lawful heir, ending with his succession in 1154. Since the chronicle largely consists of the military history of the civil war, many castles and towns are mentioned throughout the text, often in some detail as a means of providing a context for the various battles. Following the news that the Lord of Bristol, the Earl of Gloucester, was preparing for a siege against the King's men in 1138, the author writes this celebratory description of the city of Bristol. So he says, Bristol is almost the richest, the richest city of all in the country receiving merchandise by sailing ships from lands near and far. It lies in the most fertile part of England and is by its very situation the most strongly fortified of all its cities. For just like what we read about Brindisi, it is a part of Gloucestershire that makes the city, narrowing like a tongue and extending a long way with two rivers washing its sides and uniting in one broad stream lower down where the land ends. There is also a strong and vigorous tide flooding in from the sea night and day. On both sides of the city, it drives back the current of the rivers to produce a wide and deep expanse of water. And while making a harbor quite suitable and perfectly safe for a thousand ships, it hems in the entire circuit of the city so closely that the whole of it seems either swimming in the water or standing on the banks. However, on one side of it, where it is considered more exposed to a siege and more accessible, a castle rising on a vast mound strengthened by wall and battlements, towers and diverse engines prevents an enemy's approach. So this description shows that Bristol was already a major port city in the 12th century, and it emphasizes the security of Bristol as a fortified city surrounded by water. It also aligns the city of Bristol with the great imperial cities of the Western Empire, with the reference to Brindisi, a port city in Puglia in southeastern Italy. When Henry returned to England in 1149 as Duke of Normandy, he went straight to Bristol to gather troops to support his claim to the throne. He invaded England in 1153 and finally persuaded Stephen to adopt him as his son and heir. This ended the civil war and Henry became king in 1154. He brought with him not only Normandy, but also the land of Gascony as one of his royal possessions. And Bristol was perfectly placed to make huge profits from the importation of Gascon wine into Southern England. This prosperity brought to Bristol by the importation of Gascon wine allowed it in the 1240s 
to make massive investments in urban expansion and in developing its harbour facilities. Marshland below the town was reclaimed and a new outer circuit of town walls and a new bridge across the Avon were built. And again, our map shows the outlines of the new walls. A new channel for the River Froome was built across land held by St Augustine's Abbey to form a large deep water harbour and this secured Bristol's future as a major port city. And the harbour side is on the left hand side of the screen. Um, the red lines are the walls and Bristol Bridge is uh, towards the middle of this picture across the River Avon. St Augustine's that provided some of the land for this reclaiming of the marshland is on the left hand side of the screen um, down here. So this is the area of the marsh, some of which was reclaimed to make um, the harbour up here. In 1373, a royal charter of Edward III created the County of Bristol, only the second of its kind in England. Before 1373, only London had enjoyed the status of an urban county. The 1373 grant was made largely as a reward for Bristol's support for Edward III's war efforts against France during the Hundred Years' War, which, uh, which went on from roughly 1337 to 1453. And this support from Bristol reflected the city wealth, but also its strategic importance as a port and an embarkation point for troops heading over from England to France. For Bristol, the third quarter, quarter of the 14th century was a period of prosperity that would not be matched until its second golden age in the 18th century. As English military fortunes in France declined in the first half of the 15th century, so too did Bristol's commercial fortunes, and the final loss of Gascony in 1453 dealt the port a severe short-term blow. However, this was only temporary, and Bristol's recovery was evident in its economic performance in the final quarter of the century. The pioneering voyages of the Bristol merchant John Cabot, who lived about 1450 to 1498, he set off across the Atlantic and opened up a new phase of Bristol's history as a transatlantic commercial port. So Cabot's early voyages paved the way for the transatlantic trade which would account for Bristol's booming economy in the 18th and 19th centuries. And of course, that's the period whose legacy survives in much of the surviving streetscapes of the modern city. When we were planning the design of the map of medieval Bristol, we chose as our reference point, the year 1480. This was the year when William Worcester, a topographer and author, compiled his topography of the streets and buildings of Bristol. So on the right is the cover of a modern edition of William Worcester's topography. And in the center is the famous drawing, um, sort of outline sketch map of Bristol from Robert Rickart's Mayor of Bristow's calendar written in about 1478. Born in Bristol in St. James's back in 1415, William Worcester wrote a set of detailed notes about the topography of his birthplace while staying with his sister in her house in St. Thomas Street in August and September of 1480. Walking the streets of Bristol, measuring the length and breadth of its built environment, Worcester constructed in the comfort of his study, a verbal map of his birthplace. So our map is a visualization of the town that Worcester described. In later life, he settled in Norwich and he died at some point between 1480 and 1485. His topography remains one of our most important sources for the history of Bristol as a medieval town and traces of his footsteps can be found throughout our map. William's approach depended on empirical measurements. He literally paced out the measurements of the city during his walks around the town. So here is his description of the church of St. Nicholas. He says, the width of the nave of St. Nicholas's church between the street called St. Nicholas is on the north side and the lower street, the other side of the crypt called the entry to the back measures less than five yards. 
And here's a detail from our map of um, Bristol, where you can see St Nicholas's Church in the centre, top centre. Here's St Nicholas's Street, and here's the entrance to the back um, on the southern side, the other side of the crypt. So uh, William Worcester was describing exactly what he could see, and so we are able to recreate it on the map. William also noted details about the social and economic life of the city, which give us a real glimpse of what life was like in late medieval Bristol. So here, for example, is his description of the council hall called the Tolsey. He says the place over against the Tolsey, where the mayor and councillors of the town meet from day to day when it seems needful, beneath the cover of a flat lead roof fronting the west door of Christchurch, measures five yards. And on the other side, fronting High Street, it measures blank yards. He left a, a, a space for when he would come back later, having measured out the distance. The meeting hall of the councillors, as well as of the mayor, sheriff and bailiffs of the town and their chief councillors, and of the chief merchants when it shall be needful, is situated next to the Tolsey Court. It is right next to the open meeting place over against the Tolsey, opposite the chancel of All Saints Church, with rooms above most worthily furnished for the ruling councillors of the said town, attached onto the south side of St Ewan's Church. So this is the area he's talking about here, St Ewan's Church here and All Saints here. And some of you will know that traces, well, in fact, quite a lot of the fabric of All Saints um, still survives now on Corn Street. And he's talking about the Tolsey, um, which was the guild hall. The word Tolsey um, comes from the word toll, the sort of tolls you pay to trade in a town. And the Z part comes from selling, sell. Um, so it's like a selling toll, the toll you need to pay in order to trade goods in the town. Seems to be a particular, particularly Bristolian word for a courthouse or a guild hall. So in the absence of tourist maps of Bristol at that time, William's description gives us a first-hand account of what the city looked like and how its built environment was used by the people who lived and worked there. Written from the point of view of someone who knew the city well, William's verbal map introduces the city to travelers coming from somewhere else, giving them a sense of the layout of the town, how to find their way round, and where the main points of interest are, whether commercial or religious. So finally, what is left of medieval Bristol that we can point to today as evidence of this very significant period in its social, architectural and commercial history? Perhaps the most obvious traces are to be found in the many religious foundations whose remains still survive. In 1480, Bristol had 18 churches around the centre of the city, many of them demolished in the 19th century or bombed during the Blitz of World War II. But traces remain, I've already mentioned All Saints, and there's also um, the fabric of St Peter's Church in Castle Park. It now stands as a ruin and is thought to be Bristol's oldest surviving church. It's first mentioned in historical records in the year 1107, although most of the surviving fabric of the church is later, um, mainly 15th century, with some other additions made in the 17th century. It was almost destroyed by fire during the Blitz of 1940, and just this very impressive outer shell remains. Another survival is the Church of St John the Baptist, found in 1192 um, under the control of Tewkesbury Abbey. It was built along the line of the original town walls, so it incorporates one of the gateways, the North Gate, into its structure, which you can still see, and I've shown that here. Inside, the crypt dates to the 14th century, and it includes a tomb to Walter Frampton, who died in 1388, one of Bristol's many successful merchants, and three times the mayor of the city. Perhaps the most impressive survivals are Bristol Cathedral and the Church of St Mary Redcliffe. Bristol Cathedral started out as St Augustine's Abbey, the, wealthy, the wealthiest monastic foundation in Bristol, founded in about 1140 by a wealthy citizen, Robert Fitzharding, who became the first Lord Barclay. 
when the monasteries were dissolved in the late 1530s, the abbey became the new cathedral of the Diocese of Bristol. The chapter house shown here and the abbey gatehouse are medieval survivals from the original 12th century abbey and are still in use today. Finally, the Church of St Mary Redcliffe contains some traces of its 12th century origins, including parts of the nave and the south aisle, some of which you can see here. The church was in existence by about 1150 and various additions were made during the medieval period, including a 13th century tower and 14th century porches and transept. The church that we see today, including its spire, substantially dates from the 19th century when the church was rebuilt, but its medieval heritage remains as one of its defining features. And this, um, this, this uh, photograph here was taken from the Anchoress's squint above the north door, looking down at some of the medieval sections. Apart from religious foundations, there are other medieval traces in the city, including parts of the castle and the town walls. Although much of the medieval fabric of the city was destroyed during the modern period, memories remain in place names, such as Old Market, Welshback, and the Rack Hay, used for drying cloth during the cloth making process. Medieval cellars and foundations survive in a number of other buildings. While the only medieval domestic roof known to have survived in Bristol can be found at number 41 High Street, now part of the Rummer Hotel. Perhaps the most impressive survival is number 43 Broad Street, Bristol's oldest surviving three-story house, which was also a shop. It was probably built in 1411 and incorporates an earlier structure, leaving us a record of centuries of use. So I hope I've been able to show you that Bristol's history as a commercial port and city is much older than one might think from looking at the modern fabric of the city. Economic growth and wartime bombing have done their damage to the medieval city, but its skeleton is there for all to see even today. By following William Worcester's steps laid down in our map, I hope many of you will be able to make Bristol medieval for yourselves. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Giles Darks, who will start sharing his screen so that he can tell you more about the design and production of the map. So over to you, Giles. Okay, very many thanks, uh, Helen, for, for that. I hope that uh, you can see my, my screen now. Um, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the process of making the map and uh, some of the decisions that were taken in the course of, of actually creating it. So just to introduce myself, uh, as Keith uh, introduced me earlier, I'm the cartographic editor for the Historic Towns Trust. And that basically means that um, I'm responsible for all the mapping, but all, also the publishing side of, of what the Historic Towns Trust does. Well, let's start off by having a look at the process of creating a base map for this particular publication. Um, we have a standard scale for all our maps, which is one to 2,500. So that's about 25 inches to the mile. And the reason for having a standard scale is that it ties in with a European series of maps and atlases of historic towns. Uh, by using that standard, uh, standard scale, you can relatively easily compare one town with another. So in the case of Bristol, what we decided to do was to use uh, Ordnance Survey, a 25 inch, one to 2,500 map in the background. And we had a choice in terms of the number of dates of different editions of Ordnance Survey maps. But uh, we decided on the map of 1918 um, for the reason that the city in the background still looks, is, is recognisable as the pre-war city, but also has enough features on it that modern day Bristolians and those who know Bristol can actually identify where the features that we mapped are. 
and can compare them with a modern map of Bristol. So what I'm showing you on the screen at the moment is the four maps that we use, the four different sheets joined together to form the background. And you can see that this particular set of maps has got quite a lot of problems. Um, they were uh, scans uh, which um, we were able to access without charge, but unfortunately you can see that they have a quite varied print quality to them, which is not untypical of, of, of Ordnance Survey maps. And also they suffered the, the slings and, and arrows of outrageous fortune. For example, the bits you can see at the edge of one map are bits of sellotape, which somebody has put on there at some time or another. And although you can, to some extent, actually remove those, uh, ultimately, I wasn't satisfied that this would provide a, a suitable base map for us. So we went to the National Library of Scotland. Many of you will be familiar with the wonderful website that they have where they have digitised many maps, Ordnance Survey and other, um, of pretty much the whole of the UK. And by zooming in, what we can actually see here is that we had a choice of maps because Bristol is on the border between Gloucestershire and Somerset, it was actually covered by both counties in the Ordnance Survey County series. And the slightly complicated diagram that you're looking at actually shows the overlap between the Gloucestershire sheets in the north and the Somerset sheets in the south. Um, the website offers you a number of different maps according to the date of survey and the date of publication. And what we chose was the Gloucestershire series from 1918. And as I say, uh, the city is still very recognizable. And this is what uh, an Ordnance Survey map from that series actually looks like. So what I did was to take the relevant sheets that we needed and to join them together in Photoshop. There you go, that's the, the inset showing you the, the specific sheet uh, that, that we're using and also gives you an idea as well about the, the quality of the printing. And we were very fortunate in that the sheets that the National Library of Scotland has are all pretty good quality and very consistent in terms of their printing. So this is the four sheets actually joined together and if you've got good eyesight, you can see uh, some duplication at the top of the maps of uh, saying what the edition is, edition of 1918. And if we actually zoom in, uh, this is the junction of the four sheets. And my aim is to make this better than Ernie Wise's wig in that you shouldn't be able to see the joins uh, between the different sheets. You will always get some um, evidence of, of join between them, but overall this is, this is really not, uh, not bad at all. And so this formed the background to the historical information that we then added. So the process of adding historical information is one of taking the base map and here you can see it in the background and it's faded out. So there's a, an element of transparency uh, to this so that you can still see the background, but you should also be able to see the historical information. And the blue uh, square, the blue rectangle rather, which you can see there denotes the approximate sheet boundaries for the working map that I was actually using. The final sheet boundaries were fairly rapidly determined, not only by the scale, but also by the size of the sheet that we can print. And we choose to use fairly standard sheet sizes, which are printers uh, called Dennis Maps, who also print for Ordnance Survey and easily handle. And in fact, this sheet size is a standard Ordnance Survey Land Ranger sheet size. So the process of actually adding information, and here we're going to zoom in on just one feature, is a question of taking different sources and adding them onto the base map. And we had a, a, a range of dates. The map is based around 1480, but you have to be a little bit flexible in terms of the dates that you're dealing with in order to have a meaningful map. Um, this is the view of St. James's Benedictine Priory, and although it's a fairly basic outline, the reason is that, as with quite a few of the buildings, not a vast amount is known about it. 
But we have this sort of source here, excavations at St. James's Priory. And you can see it's a fairly generalized view of what actually went on. Generalized, yes, but don't forget that at the scale of one to 2,500, there's not a vast amount of detail that you can show. And although I'm zooming in here on the detail, um, you can't actually see a huge amount more when you see the final printed product. For comparison here, here we have uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Again, this was a diagram which was given to me. And then my interpretation of that as it actually appears on the map. And you can begin to see that it's not only the hospital that's shown here, but a bit of context as well. Some of the other features around here, we have one of the gates in the city wall, and we have some of the houses that we featured, uh, which were either contemporary 1480 or a little bit after, but they do help to provide context for the medieval features that we were showing on the map. We were also fortunate in having a map which the Historic Towns Trust had originally published in the 1970s. This is the map of Bristol as featured in the uh, Atlas volume, which included Bristol. Um, the different sheets that comprise that map were joined together here. And if we actually zoom in on one feature, here we've got St. Augustine's Abbey, which later became the Cathedral Church. So we did at least have a foundation for uh, providing information about some of these features. However, we were very conscious that in the 40 years since this atlas was first published, uh, many places have undergone either archaeological investigation or historical investigation, and therefore we know more about them than we did then. And therefore what we have on this map is subject to quite a lot of revision. So this is how St. Augustine's Abbey actually appears on our map. In some ways, it looks like less information, but actually it's probably more reliable. And you can see that we've now got features included, for example, the, um, uh, the water fountain, which ended at the, the conduit, um, which I will show you a little bit more of in, in a minute, but also features like the dovecot and indeed the precinct of the Abbey Church as well which uh, again uh, gives you some idea of the extent of the precincts of the medieval foundations surrounding the city centre. And I was also provided with other more detailed plans. So this is a detailed plan of the cathedral, in this case showing different phases of development. And it was a question of trying to work out from that what was around in 1480 and then depicting it on a map. The map shows a number of different sorts of feature. And here I'm showing you the legend from the map and the different types of features that we actually showed. And you can see that as well as using area features, so for example, land use for graveyards, different sorts of buildings, we also have the lines which comprise the city wall and also one or two other boundaries. I will show you the boundary of the County of Bristol in a moment but also the different styles of lettering that we use to denote different features. And here's the city centre. Helen showed you this, uh, an extract very similar to this earlier. Um, with a map of this size, it's inevitable that most of the features we want to show are going to be concentrated in the city centre. And uh, so it is, uh, here is really the heart of the city, showing some of the churches that were there, but also the many um, inns and principal buildings as well, which we wanted to show, again, to give context and, and to give more information. And also, uh, Helen showed this before, Bristol Castle. Um, you will notice that on this extract and indeed on the map, we have quite a lot of because we often don't know a great deal about what we're mapping. And indeed, Bristol Castle was slightly contentious in, in the fact that there are different interpretations of what was there. Ultimately, you have to make a decision when you're producing a historical map. Um, you're aware that when you put any feature onto it, it tends to assume an authority which it may not actually merit. 
anything shown on a map looks solid and real and definite and yet very often the information that you've been provided with is anything but but putting on things like question marks is absolutely fine because ultimately if you avoid putting features onto maps because you're not entirely sure, eventually you end up with a map with almost nothing on it, and that really is of very little use to anybody. So uh, Helen also mentioned that we showed the uh, former course of the River Froome before 1240 when it was diverted, and this is the way that it was actually shown on our map and the label that I put on there to denote where it was. Looking at slightly wider, uh, we have uh, some features in the uh, around the edge of the map. You can see a dotted line. If I zoom in on this part of the map here, what it is actually showing is the boundary of the county of Bristol, which Helen mentioned. And it's actually really useful to map this. In fact, most of it is accommodated on the map sheet. And it gives you some idea of the slightly strange shape that it had. Uh, but also, uh, I think, uh, gives context to the parts that were within the built up area and those that were actually outside of it. And we also, this is the whole map sheet now, the final map sheet being viewed. We also had an inset map as well, showing trades and occupations, because a lot of research has been done on this. And although, as ever, it's a generalization, it is true to say that these particular uh, trades and occupations were indeed associated with different parts of the city. And some of you may spot uh, some, some quite interesting uh, entries on there. Well, uh, the map also carries a reverse as well. Uh, this is very important for our maps because the idea is that we have a gazetteer, a list of the buildings and sites of interest that are included on the map with some notes about them and essentially an introduction. And it's very much aimed at the non-specialist people, you know, that, that uh, remarkable beast, the intelligent general reader. And so the idea is to give some information about the main features that are shown on the map, a brief history, um, no references, but something basically to introduce you to what they are. And here is part of the entry for Bristol Castle. And we also have, have illustrations as well. And again, Helen, Helen mentioned this before, but this is the, the wonderful drawing of Bristol Cross, uh, which came from um, uh, Robert Rickarts, uh, the mayor of Bristol, his calendar. Um, which is uh, an important uh, illustration in terms of not only the history of Bristol, but also the depiction of medieval towns. And you'll notice the gateways that are shown on there. And indeed, we describe the different gateways in the city in some detail. And we also have a section on the map which is devoted to looking at uh, Bristol's uh, medieval houses, medieval and slightly later houses, uh, a lot of research has been done on this by uh, Professor Roger Leach and others. And so we have entries, for example, Haddon's Tavern, which is right in the town centre, and some notes about it as well, but uh, notes about the different types of houses that actually appear. And we also have not just uh, houses and principal buildings, but things like conduits which in Bristol are quite important as they were in many towns the supply of fresh water and here we have an extract from the St Augustine's Abbey conduit and an extract from the map showing you how it's actually depicted and um, those of you who know the topography of Bristol will appreciate that uh, many of these springs were on the higher ground and so gravity worked in favour of the distribution of the water to where it was actually needed. Well, finally, just to have a brief look at the map cover, and this is the map cover. You'll see it's got both sides, so we have to design it with the, both the front, the spine and the back at the same time. And it's very important when you're creating any publication to have an attractive cover and one of the most important things is choosing a picture, an image that is suitable on the cover. Um, you'll know the, the, the famous phrase, never judge a book by its cover. Well, one of my mottos is always judge a book by its cover because we always do. 
And in a bookshop, you have half a second or so to engage someone who is browsing. So you want an attractive image that is going to lure them in. Now, of course, we have no contemporary views of Bristol in 1480, but the idea was to look for an image that is sort of redolent of a medieval city, but is also specifically of Bristol. And we had a number of contenders. This is the one that we chose, but there are various other rather uh, attractive um, watercolors and, and, and other pictures of Bristol, which we had to choose from. But ultimately, I, I chose the one that you, you, you actually see. It was a committee decision, but um, I overruled one or two people who didn't want it, but there we go. And this is the reverse of the map. Again, you, you write a short blurb and uh, you um, have an extract from the map. And it's important to show an extract from this map and not from an old map of Bristol. People want to see what the map actually includes. And then the final element is the introductory essay that we have on the inside. The idea of this essay is to explain um, what the map is about. It gives a little context. And here you'll see that we have uh, um, a, a, a section actually specifically on William Worcester, but also to point out the features on the map that are, are worth looking at in general. Um, you will know that on the back of the map, we have the gazetteer giving you information about specific buildings, but this is the general introduction to the map. And it's designed again for the non-specialist, for the general reader who's interested to have an idea once they've seen the map of, of what it is that we're actually showing and why it's really important to map it. Well, it was very much a, a, a joint effort and Helen mentioned the team of people who were behind it. And so I think it is very appropriate to actually show their names on here. And we're very grateful for the, the hard work that they put in, a lot of research and a lot of writing went on uh, to actually produce this map. And so we're, we're pleased with it. Um, I think graphically it's got one or two limitations. I, I did say that uh, once it was published, but I hope that it is a contribution to the history of Bristol and that you find it interesting. As with all our publications, we hope that it will actually stimulate debate and research. And if you find something that you think is wrong or you know better about or subsequent research reveals something different, then we very much want to know about it and so that we can revise our maps for subsequent editions. So that is basically it from me. I will finish uh, sharing my